this is your property here. Tell, me, tell us, you know, how, how, how big a property have you got here? Okay, in total it's 11 hectares. Um, it's the corners down there comes along that uh, fence line there just behind the dam, up the side and just over the back a bit um, and butts onto the forest. And then there's a quarter um, taken out over there for another property. We've yeah. been here for about six, uh, 16 years. Can everyone hear by the way? No, we're, we're good. That's 16 years. And what, what do you, you have animals, obviously you've got a few horses. Yep. What else do you have? Do you have? Uh, we've got some cattle um, and the cattle we can, we adjust uh, or lease the forest, which helps out quite a bit for the cattle. And uh, we bring them into the different paddocks. We try and cross graze with the horses just to help with the worming situation. All right. And so, so in relation to your horses, what, what are they eating? Okay. Um, can I start on about how I, why I got into native grasses and what I really want them to eat? All the better. <laughs> Interview yourself. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm very much into, into barefoot um, and, you know, that's not just a horse with no shoes. That's actually a barefoot trimmed horse. So they're a lot softer on the paddock. Um, and um, through my um, experience with that, I can see just what, uh, what we're feeding the horses and what it's actually doing to their feet, creating... Um, the, you know, when the grasses, uh, particularly exotic grasses, will have a higher sugar content in them generally, but then when there's a frost on them or when there's a bit of drought, they, um, they will get even higher in sugars. And, and was, that, was that causing you issues? Were you seeing it's, problems? It's causing issues in the horse's feet and giving them laminitis. And it might only be small episodes of laminitis all the time, but you can tell if there's a ring on the horse's foot, that's a mild... Um, low, low grade laminitis attack and so because all the, the native pastures and everything or sorry all the pastures exotic pastures have been um, specifically developed for cattle and dairies and and sheep it's just not what the horses need um, so it's really important that we get back to nature as much as possible and hello Rex <laughs> he's my quilty horse I did my hundred miler on him ten years ago <laughs> um, and so it's really important that I get the horses um, on, a, on a great diet. I try to keep it as natural as possible as I can. Um, I don't rug them except the old fellow who's nearly 30. He needs a little bit of help. Um, but uh, you can see like they've been grazing on here and I've kind of moved the fences up with them. So at the moment we're right here. So then we'll go around it. Um, but despite that, there's no chewing up of the ground and that's really the barefoot um, because it's natu naturally trimmed. Um, so it doesn't dig up like a horse with shoes on or a untrimmed horse, which is quite, you know, they, they can do a lot of damage as well. So, so how, how long would you leave the horses in here? Um, they, I... Mm, it's a little hard to say, actually, Ian. Or you just judge that according to what the grass Yeah, I do. Is. As they eat it down, um, I move them up. And because um, we've got a couple of active horses and one that's... Um, there's actually three, uh, four horses here, but one's uh, an endurance horse and that's uh, out on a ride at the moment. So I have four horses here and I simply manage them by moving the fence lines up. I give them... I move this fence line to give them a couple of metres of grazing and then I'll move that one up. So I don't, I need to give them enough room so that they're not being, um, the, the older one isn't being challenged or stressed because stress can bring on laminitis too. So um, I just kind of move that fence up and this one as well, but I don't actually just move them straight off of what they've got. So they've probably got access to that half, you know, for say two weeks and then they get it new and it so, gets so, moved up. So they've got a long row here, yeah. but also up there, no, I, I, the benefit of being here once before is that they go up along the fence and up around the back. That's right. They've got to go up and around up to get their water. And those two cypress trees are their shelter. I don't have any, any um, stables or anything like that. So I just try and keep it as natural as possible, but trying to create more movement each time. So they're, so they're walking all the time? They're walking. They have to walk all the time. So they're back and forth, back and forth, and that, that's what horses need, of course. That's right. So um, up there I've got gravel up at the fence and then I feed them a bit of hard feed up there which is just, I call it hard feed, but it's just um, a bit of uh, maxi soy and chaff so I can put their minerals and salt into it. So Now in, in terms of the grass here, you, you, you were, you've been talking about changing the grasses over. 
So I think you're doing some plot work here, is that right? Yes, that's right. Right here we've got our Themida. 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 Themida plot, kangaroo grass. Um, it's, it was, uh, I w had a lot of help here with Bob Myers in, um, in getting this established. Um, in December 2012, um, we got hay from um, Bob's property like kangaroo grass hay, and it was right at Christmas time and it was when the seed was just ready to, um, to come off the plant. And we actually laid the hay out. And there's actually three distinct areas here um, where we did, it, did the hay spreading a little bit differently just to see what the effect was. Um, it was quite interesting because on our clothes was these little spearheads of the kangaroo grass that were trying to get into our clothes. It was quite, it's an interesting little grass with a little awn on it, which spin, will spin around in the wind to push the, the seed down into the, into the soil. Um, then around September, or August, I think it was, August, September um, 2013, we um, glyphosphated this air, that area there. Um, to kill the, um, there was no kangaroo grass evident there. It was to kill the pasture that was there. And then a month later when it was all dead, we burnt it because there's a, um, a, a, an enzyme, a carbon there's in the smoke that um, will help the kangaroo grass to germinate. So it likes to have, be burnt. I don't know if it can grow without that, can it? Can oh, it will grow without it, will it grow but that, that stimulates good, good, good growth. Good growth, yes. Okay. So, uh, so can I just, just repeat that because I think it's really important here. You, so when you when you spread the the thermometer straw uh, with the seed, what had you done? Had you done anything prior to that? Uh, yes, I beg your pardon. We had sprayed it out. So it had been yeah. sprayed, and then so it had been sprayed. Then you laid the straw over the top. Actually, then, I'm not sure. Then you let it just, you know, just emerge through to, that. Yeah, I need to check with. I'm not sure that we did spray it. Was it sprayed before? I don't was, think we did spray it. Before the straw was on. No. No, we didn't. No, no, no. We, we if we'd done a full photo mm. presentation for you, you would have seen, you would have seen, grass standing, some clumps of grass standing that high, and then a bit of broadleaf weed down there, and then we cast the, the from our big pile of, of straw, uh, from our hay that we'd cut, so that came straight from from my place in a trailer to here, and then we just opened the tarp up and then took out big sheaths and just threw them in a pattern so that there were heads, stalks, and then we'd put heads over the stalks so you had that kind of layering across the site. And because there were some stooky grasses, we then walked through and kind of pushed it all down so it was not going to be blown by a wind if a wind came. So, so what we're talking about here is not massive soil ground, soil preparation. We're not talking about... Uh, incredible sort of effort to actually create create a perfect seed bed, but you still got a result. Yes, we did. Uh, it, yeah. It's not right at the moment. It's not outstanding in the sense that you can sort of get knocked over and look at thermometer. But what what you look anyone will see out there, there's the the dark clumpy plants. They're the, they're the big thermometer plants. Now they're they're dormant at this time of year. They're not actively growing, but you, you've still got them there, and they 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 will when when it comes to uh, the warmer season, they'll actually grow up quite tall. They for the moment they're completely dormant um, and then and then we didn't get any germination um, in uh, after we burnt it off um, nothing really much happened there was maybe one or two seedlings that we found it was terribly dry wasn't yeah, it? very dry then we had five inches of rain in the February uh, in 2014 and uh, we got excited because there was just germination everywhere. It just needed a really good rain and it was just amazing. So um, that was great. And it's just been going ahead from there. We've still got ryegrass in there because we, um, before I knew anything, I did have this pasture or all our pastures actually sown to a ryegrass, which was supposedly um, good for horses, but not good in the sense of what I know now. So, um, so the, you know, the, the way I'm looking after the kangaroo grass in there, it's also looking after the rye grass. So I did dig out some of the really big clumps so it looked a little better, but there's a lot more work to go on in there. And I've been spraying it um, quite regularly to get rid of the cape, uh, the broadleaf, but I've obviously missed a bit because I do it all by hand. Um, then in May this year, I, we glyphosphated that square at the end there. And then there's more down that end as well. 
We should have a look at that too, Pauline, because that's got the gallop in it down there. So, so when we come back on, a, on the next visit, the summer visit, see how the, how the gallop is established. And Ian will point to some of the seedlings now. Mm. So, so th that area was glyphosated yes. once? Yes. Not Just twice? Once. No, once. Just once? And then, and then how long did you leave it after the spray? Only about two weeks. Right, yeah. so the plants had died, mm -hmm. you got yellowing across the site. Yeah. Did you remove any of the material? Um, it was a problem actually because there's quite a bit of Guildford grass here yes. and it did cause a problem with the harrows um, and it did, yeah, it was, we could have done a little better I think, we yep. decided. Everyone know what the Guildford, Guildford grass is? Mm. Anyone not know? Maybe this is... That's yeah, the nut one, you can see where the... That's one that's being, being pulled out. I presume your cockies are getting... Yeah, the cockies, yeah. cockies love it. They're just going for that nut on the bottom. Mm. I wish they'd work a bit harder. <laughs> um, we're, we're more acidic. The, um, I can't remember what the last test was, but we did have some, um, we did spread lime. Um, that would have been around seven or eight years ago to bring it up, but we didn't get it up to the ideal 7.2. Um, and I think we're still around five. I'm not sure what Bob's report said. No, but no, we'll go through some of those. Yeah. I mean, those details will be available. Um, they're not all, all the personal property details haven't been kind of released, but I've got Wayne Brown from Environments by Design and Bob Long, a local soil specialist, to look at the property and, uh, and the area that's been killed. Did you say that that's been, that's the Guilf, we've, that's metsulfur and methyl on Guilford grass to try and take it out because there's no way that you can repasture this property without that being gone. Because it's toxic to sheep and cattle and you can bet that the toxicity is the same with a horse, although as we know the, the gut metabolism is a bit different. But the trouble with this, this non-grass is that it balls. So once it's in the, in the stomach, it's balling in the stomach. And so I'm quite sure that if we look at the complications that are recorded somewhere in Australia on horses and this grass will find that it is just as de deleterious to, to horses as it is to cattle and sheep. And that's Guildford grass? That's Guildford, Guildford grass. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it goes under a variety of names. Sometimes onion weed, sometimes Guildford grass, sometimes you know, nut grass, you know, the variety. Well, this often gets a pink flower too. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that's the, usually that's so it's often the same plant, given different names. So that's the the really hard spiky stuff. Um, and it does it can get really long. Um, oh, it's not the, like the, the that, uh, no, that's sedge in there. But that's it's always like that. It doesn't stick up by itself. Yeah. Just one spike. Yeah. It smells a bit it like an onion do. though, doesn't it? You can the get, we've got. there's a variety that does smell yeah. very oniony and it's not quite as stiff and hard as that, like that's quite wiry. Yeah. So the two species on this property will be Romulea major and minor really, so you've got, uh, yeah, one of them, one of them has a, a pink flower, these are just close to ground level, a pink flower sets lots of seeds in that and the other one's got a purple and white. They're star-shaped flowers. So can I ask what the... That's sedge. Oh. Mm. And, and the horses eat that. It's native. Can I just ask, please, what are you planning to do with the Themida? Are you just going to let the horses graze on it as is now, or are you going to plan to make hay from it? Or how are you going to deliver it to the horse's tummy? As it is now, this is my seed bank and I'll be collecting the seed from it and um, expanding the area of the growth. Um, my whole idea originally was to have seed bank areas running down the paddock and then cross uh, moving the horses that way. But I've actually found that having the temporary fencing is actually working better because horses do track and, and it stops them tracking because the fence is never going to be in the same place twice. So I'll, I'll, I'll keep this as a seed bank and I will be establishing native um, pasture within here that they will be grazing normally, but I'll still maintain my seed bank. That's how I'm thinking about it. And I would love to plant it in. This is my horse paddock. I call it the horse paddock down there because that's what I try and um, 
make it the best for horses for the hay. So it's got phalaris in it, it's got coxfoot. I try and keep all the clover out of it and all the um, broadleaf grasses and I'll cut it really early in the morning. I'll cut it when the seed heads are dropped and really early in the morning to ensure that the sugar is as low as possible. And I've had it tested a couple of years um, uh, when I've sent it over to the US and it's all been uh, 8%, 9%. So yeah, it is good, yeah. So I keep that just for the horses, but that is where I want to establish the kangaroo grass to be part of that. Whether I can do the whole paddock, I don't know, because... Yeah. So, so your next, next shift of the fences will be where? Um, we'll actually come up and around and come to the front, but we won't use that bit, obviously. So I'll actually, I'm actually thinking of making them go a bit further down there so that then they have to come up here. Just make them move, keep them moving, <laughs> yeah. Terrific. Do, we, do you want to have a look at the, the plot up here? Yeah. Okay. So we, we, we're, we're climbing the fence. Thank you. Oh, you, I get lost. Oh, you're doing good. Yeah. This, this one here. Oh, that, oh yeah. That's your, oh, that's your kangaroo grass seed oh, head. Yeah. So now that, that's that's the uh, the kangaroo grass seed. That's the obvious one. Hey, can you smile? I need one for Carol. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. You had a horse bite in the back as well. It's really good. So there's actually quite a lot of kangaroo in amongst all that. But you don't see it in, when you're back there. You actually see it when you're in here. Mm. Oh, not going to let me out. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> We love it. Oh, I should mention about my dung beetles and the work that they're doing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Karen, do you have the long beaked corellas? Yes, they're, they're the ones. Like they're the ones the doing ones the thing. Doing but we, we've um, got galahs. We've had paddocks of, um, oh, sorry, her, flocks. I should say flocks of galahs, um, the sulphur crested cockies, the Adelaide Hills rosellas, and the wood ducks yeah. all together just having a go. Plenty of seedlings here, yeah. They they don't don't go finding it but I think they do get it with their as the, you can see there. Yeah, yeah you can see they kind of leave it and it seems to be that the cockies tend to go over where the horses have been because it stands out probably a lot more. Yeah. Well yeah just just here along here. So the, the detail for what has happened here is in your folder. When you go through, you'll find uh, Parawina Chroma and a bit of the story and additional stuff to what Pauline said. And then, um, and then the Femata plot history, that's down there as well. Um, and, and then the, this, the Gallup plot mix and the, and the story about that and how much seed was used and whatever. So. Um, yeah, so as you can see, because of the patches of of uh, broadleaf weed that are there, um, the the kill on this wasn't complete, um, but we had to seed, capitalise on warm soil, and so we seeded before everything was dead. So as a result of that, you do get this this residual problem, and uh, this needs a dicamba spray with a bit of pulse in it. Um, surfactant to take all of these broad leaves out so that there's nothing competing for the remaining moisture in the soil as it starts to diminish probably this month and into September. How long Bob before you can hit it with the dicamba? Oh well, you can do that at any time. Yeah it's mm. not really too small to struggle I don't you think? No you won't kill them. I wouldn't be spraying it just yet. I'd, I'd be holding off just because some of these signals are very small. But there's, there's, you know, you, 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 this, is, this is where expertise comes in, I guess, but you know, recognising these seedlings is not necessarily that easy. But yeah, you, can, you can find, if you, when you jump over the fence at some stage or look, look close, if you, you look at the purpley coloured ones there, they're, they're the wallaby grass seeds, and there's a number of those that are swollen and, and emerging little, little, little seedlings. And I'll just see if I can find. I think I'll just 
just squashed, just squashed one. I can see the blue dot. Yeah, so they're, they're, they're actually, they're, they're just, they're just coming out of the seedling now. See, the, the, the wheat grass is a slightly, slightly bigger seedlings and they're, they're, they're now germinating. You, you can see a lot of those, there's also clearly a lot of this you know, Guildford grass or you know, onion weed re-emerging. You know, that, that's still there. It hasn't been killed by the whole process as yet. You know, well, no, that it's because that it was not a. This wasn't a met sulfur and methyl process here. Okay, so so there's still going to be that one as you know as, as a uh, as a nuisance here. There's clearly a few ryegrass plants and and others that are that have that are cling, clinging on and just sort of remaining around. But there, it looks a bit underwhelming, I guess, right at the moment. But come back in a, in a, in a couple of months, and this will be really really quite a quite a strong stand. There's a lot of seedlings in amongst it. Uh, the point, the point, I guess that we've we've made, uh, we're making the other the other day was that you don't necessarily have to go to the whole, the whole shooting match of the cultivation, the the whole uh, you know, the whole process of cultiv you know, rotary hoeing, etc., etc. You can get away with less uh, less preparation and still get a result. Clearly, the result's better the more preparation you do. You know, but if you, you know, you can, uh, as, as, as Pauline's shown there, with virtually no preparation on that, it's still got themata established. You know, that's, that's no preparation. That's going not even, you know, not even sprayed the area beforehand. So, so there's a lot of, you know, it's just really quite a simple thing. You, you, if you go from no preparation, you get some result. Right, a full preparation, you get full result. And it's, uh, it's. But it's there's all, still, all there's still fire in that one. We're still, that still has to be fired. So you have to get rid of all that. Yes. stuff that was there that you cast the, the kangaroo grass into. So on your property you have to be prepared, if you do it that way, to burn. Um, and, and of course I think we, I mentioned or left something in, in your pack about a, a substance called blaze tamer, which you can add to your knapsack and spray on the edge of an area that, you've, that, that you need to burn. So that one down there for example. In the case of Mike and and Pauline, we just mowed a, mowed a patch and brought a big fire unit up, so we had 400 litres of water if something unusual happened. But of course, if you get your timing right, if you know your country, then it's, it's hard for something to go wrong with that kind of burn. And I've been burning since 1997, and so far so good. Um, now, Pauline, you're going to use this as your seed, seed production yes. area, if you like. Yeah. Your seed source. So you'll, when, when this is running seed, you'll, you'll start just shifting it down a bit? Um, yeah, so I'd like to collect the seed from here and start introducing it into the rest of the paddock. So I'm interested to see um, about how you can do that, if you can do that um, in the ex with the exotic pasture as it is, and then eventually try and encourage more of the native grasses to take off and hopefully push out exotics. I'm not sure if that's a possibility. Um, because obviously we're not on a big property, um, so you know it will be hard to lose what I use for hay now, like for hay production, because I need the hay still. So it's going to be a bit of a toss up there. It's all compensation, isn't it? Yeah. So the beautiful thing is, when we come back in um, in January, um, we'll see how this has fared. Um, if, if we've taken a harvest from the kangaroo grass, we'll leave a square metre or so, so that you can, you can see that. Um, uh, and there'll be some, some important lessons there because we are looking at, at having year-long production, year-long growth in the soil, so that, so that we've got a healthier soil. So, um, but yeah, looking at something in January is very significant. Um, I just thought too, what I have um, on this property, um, I talked about what I'd done earlier and that was planting ryegrass and um, also liming it, but um, since I've had my change of heart, um, the only other things that I've done here is um, I make my own liquid fertiliser just with the hay and the, uh, the horse and the um, cow manure and then just kind of um, dilute it then and then spray, spray it out in my normal spray pack. So I've done that to the paddock. I've also spread that guana um, mineral mix and I've also I've put a concoction of uh, worm juice and comfrey juice and sprayed that as well. 
Um, I'd like to think that's perhaps why, surprisingly, the organic, the organic is high, yeah. higher than what I would have thought. Other def defici there are deficiencies there, mm. but the, the organic uh, material is pretty good. So, Surprising. right now, we've run out of time. Uh, I can tell Kim, yeah, so we, uh, we need to find a bus, okay?